Next, CityNet 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Candidates will respond to questions from our City Club panel. Our questioners today are Corleen Kraft, member of the City Club Program Committee, and Beth Burzak, member of the board of the League of Women Voters of Oregon. Questions were submitted in advance of the meeting in writing by City Club and League members. Questions will be directed to specific candidates and will be asked in 15 seconds. Candidates will have one minute to respond. The candidates have not seen the questions in advance, and these are the only questions that will be asked today. There will be no questions from the floor. Timekeeper Jan Wolf, member of the League of Women Voters of Portland, seated in front, will time both the questions and the responses. Following the questions from our panel, each candidate will ask the same two questions of each of the other candidates. Questions will be asked in 30 seconds. Responses will be one minute. And the questioner will have 30 seconds for an optional rebuttal. Following this series of cross-questioning among the candidates, each candidate will have three minutes for a closing statement. This meeting is governed by the program format that I've just described and by the rules of conduct which are displayed on all of your tables. In consideration of our radio audience time and candidates, we ask that you try to refrain from any applause or demonstration of um, feelings during this debate. And the program will adjourn promptly at quarter after one o'clock. Our candidates today are Democratic incumbent David Wu, who will be participating by way of an audio feed from Washington, D.C. State Senator Charles Starr of the Republican Party and Beth King of the Libertarian Party. I'll now ask our candidates who are with us today to approach their podiums and we will begin with opening statements. We will begin with an opening statement from Beth King followed by David Wu and then Charles Starr. Okay, I'll bend down to talk into the microphone. Welcome everyone, I'm glad that you could be here today and welcome to David there in Washington. Thank you very Before much. I <laughs> Before I get started with my opening statement, I would like to thank the Portland City Club and the Oregon League of Women Voters for giving me the opportunity to participate in today's debate. I'd also like to thank my supporters that are here today and I would especially like to thank my husband Robert because it's not easy being married to a candidate. I not only have a full-time job, I'm also co-owner of an internet business, and so I have been extremely busy, and he's been just such a huge support. For the last week, I have been trying to figure out what exactly I would say to you, because I have such a short amount of time to do it, that would make an impact. So I thought I would do something that really made an impact for me, and so what I'm going to do, and forgive me because I stole this from David Letterman, but I'm going to do the top 10 reasons why Beth King is running for Congress. Reason number 10, abolition of private property. If you own your home, try not paying, not paying your property taxes and see how long it is till you're kicked out. Reason number nine, heavy progressive income tax. The average American pays about seven or 47% of taxes in one form or another. Reason number eight, Abolition of rights of inheritance. What comes to mind there is the estate tax. Reason number seven, confiscation of property of rebels. I think of asset forfeiture. Reason number six, a central bank. Federal Reserve comes to mind there. Reason number five, government ownership of communication and transportation, light rail. Reason number four, government ownership of factories and agriculture, government subsidies. Reason number three, government control of labor. 
minimum wage law. Reason number two, corporate farms, regional planning, metro. And reason number one, government control of education, our public school system. Believe it or not, I just gave you the Communist Manifesto of 1848. And on the other side is the Bill of Rights. This is where we started. Look how close we are getting to this. And these are the top 10 reasons why I'm running for Congress. Thank you. Thank you. And now to our virtual candidate, David Wu. Hi, I'm David Wu. Um, I thought that the only time that uh, I'd be doing something like this, I'd, I'd like to do this at my wake, but the long distance <laughs> charges might be prohibitive. I live in Hillsdale with my wife, Michelle, uh, whom I understand is uh, in the audience, um, and uh, our two children. I've been proud to represent you in Congress for the past two years. I came to this position from a career helping Oregonians start businesses in high technology and international trade. I decided to run for office because I believe very, very strongly that public decisions make a crucial difference in people's lives. They've had an important impact on my life, and I want to have the same positive effect on the lives of Oregonians. My first priority has always been education. I earned a spot on the House Education Committee, and I've been working hard to reduce class size. We're beginning to see teachers arrive in Oregon, and they are making a difference. I've been fighting for school modernization and building additional facilities so that teachers will have an effective place to teach and students will have a safe place to learn. I've been working hard on school safety and wrote bipartisan legislation to require that students caught bringing a weapon to school will be detained and held for evaluation and punishment. Legislation like this could have prevented the tragedy in Springfield. But in education, as in other fields, it's not just about money and not just about legislation. It's also about listening and leadership. I visited schools in almost every community in this congressional district and I talk to students about the importance of working hard in school, and I talk with adults about the importance of being involved in the lives of our young people and in the schools. Nothing makes a difference like being involved as an adult in our public schools. On other issues, I've worked hard to shore up Social Security and Medicare and adding a guaranteed prescription drug benefit to Medicare that's available to any senior who chooses it. In these times of unprecedented prosperity, it's incumbent upon us to use the budget surplus to save Social Security and Medicare first. I've been working hard on strong, bipartisan, and an enforceable patient bill of rights, one that gives you access to the nearest emergency room, lets you choose a doctor, and lets your physician be an advocate for you in the health care system. These are very, very important issues in the lives of Oregon families. I've worked on these issues very hard for the past two years, and we've made progress. But there's much more work to be done. I'll continue to seek common sense solutions to the problems that face the lives of Oregonians. Thank you very much. Thank you, Congressman Wu. Mr. Starr? I appreciate this opportunity. The City Club and the League of Women Voters have provided us. Thank you very much. I'm Charles Starr, seeking your support to be your representative in Congress, Oregon's first district. I want to continue my lifetime of public service representing your interest in Washington. I'm a lifelong farmer and for 22 years, a small businessman. Our current Congressman, David Wu, is a freshman who barely won with 50% of the vote. He promised he would listen to Oregon. He has not. Instead, he has listened to one person, Bill Clinton. David Wu has chosen to listen to him and vote against Oregon again and again. One major difference between my opponent and me is that I've been listening to Oregon. I know Oregon, and Oregon knows my record of common sense legislative achievement. The focus of my campaign is Oregon working families. Let me tell you a few of the principles that I will follow. To our greatest generation, our seniors, let me be clear. I am going to save Social Security first. I will vote for legislation that protects your hard-earned money and oppose anyone that would threaten the solvency of Social Security, your money. I support elimination of the death tax and the marriage tax penalty. My opponent, David Wu, refused to vote against the death tax. Let me say a few words about education. I have been a teacher and elected to two school boards, 
have served on the Education Committee in the Oregon Legislature, have a solid track record of achievement and reform. David Wu refuses to reform education, and he has voted against teachers and students time and again. Let's talk about health care. I believe that only two people should determine the level of your medical care, you and your doctor. I support federal legislation to make sure that this relationship is never infringed upon. I support a patient's bill of rights and a special promise to my fellow seniors. I will fight to make sure that prescription drugs are accessible at a fair price for all Oregonians. Here's another principle. I believe that farmers and loggers still provide a foundation for our local economy, and farmers and loggers are excellent stewards of our natural resources. I will work to expand trade for Oregon agriculture, will work to open markets in the Pacific Realm, Africa, the Caribbean, and the Middle East. I am proud to be supported by Intel, Nike, and other businesses that provide employment for families in this district. David Wu voted against thousands of jobs hardworking men and women of Oregon when he voted against fair trade. I invite you, everyone to visit our campaign online at starforcongress.org. If you want common sense Oregon values in Congress, then this campaign is your campaign and I am your candidate. I ask for your support. I ask for your vote. Thank you, Mr. Starr. We will now move to the next portion of our program, which consists of questions from our panelists, Corleen Kraft and Beth Burzak. Candidates will have one minute to respond to each question, and the first question will come from Corleen Kraft. We will have three rounds of questions. Corleen. Ms. King, you favor lowering taxes. How specifically would you change our tax system, and are there proposals now being discussed that you support? Well, actually, I'm a firm believer that before we can lower taxes, we need to cut waste in government. And what I would do is look at some of the redundancies that go on in government. For instance, I have some statistics here where in the federal government we have 74 clean water programs. We have 127 programs for at-risk youth. We have 340 programs for children and families and 12 food safety programs. Those kinds of redundancies, I think we need to eliminate and have one department that handles specifics. And through cutting the size of government, then we can start looking at cutting taxes. Congressman Wu, how can the government provide increased medical services for all citizens and keep the cost under control? Well, I believe that uh, Medicare has been more effective than many private plans uh, in uh, cost control uh, mechanisms. Uh, Medicare has led the way in uh, diagnostic categories and in other uh, related ways to uh, help keep costs down. Um, I think that as we expand coverage to prescription drugs, uh, and to other uh, vital services such as long-term care that some of the uh, savings from bulk buying and some of the savings uh, from better management uh, can be uh, grown into those areas so that uh, there will not be the uh, continued rate of increase in medical costs that we have seen over the last several decades. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Mr. Starr, the United States is facing another potential energy crisis. What initiatives do you support to either increase the energy resources or lower the cost of the existing supply? Thank you for the question. Our uh, country has tremendous energy resources, energy reserves, some of which have not been fully explored and some of which have not been fully tapped. I believe that in facing the future energy situation in the world, we should not continue our dependency upon foreign energy to the level that it is today, and that we should begin uh, exploration and recovery of those resources that we have in our country. 
Some of those are in environmentally sensitive areas, but we can deal with that and protect our environment. Ms. King, should foreign agricultural workers be granted legal status and assured minimum wages and housing allowances in the United States? That's a good question. <laughs> Actually, I think that immigration is good to have people come in from other countries. As far as giving special status, I think that when people come to America, they have as much opportunity as anybody else. I had an example where I was down at Immigrations a few months ago, and there was a woman who was from another country who was here on a, a green card who was insisting that the federal government pay her education. And I was standing there because I was one who couldn't get grants and things like that, and I thought, you know, here you're in the land of opportunity. There's all kind of opportunity for people that choose to pick it. So I do not go for special favoritism. Thank you. Mr. Wu, what issues must be evaluated in trade relations with other countries, and how much weight should be given to the human rights? Well, I believe that um, a range of issues need to be considered. Trade is important. Trade is good. But I believe that, you know, you're really referring back to my vote on most favored nation trading status on China. And, and with respect to that, that should come as no surprise to the voters of Oregon. I committed to the voters of Oregon on my position on that issue, and I kept my commitment to the voters of Oregon. I kept my commitment to what I felt to be good policy, and I kept my commitment to my own conscience. For that, I offer no apologies. I think that when we run a tremendous trade surplus, as we do with China, I'm, I'm sorry, that when we run a tremendous trade deficit and they have a tremendous trade surplus, that we have leverage. And in a situation where we have leverage, we can consider issues like human rights, the rule of law, how a country behaves with respect to its neighbors. Those are important responsibilities of a great power. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Mr. Starr, how can the INS balance the protection of United States borders with the free flow of commerce necessary in a global economy? The INS is the agency charged with securing our borders, and under federal law and statutes, they they do that at our ports of entry uh, around the country. I think it's terribly important that the law in place be enforced. But I believe that heavy-handed uh, enforcement that appears to discriminate against individuals of other nationalities is unfortunate, uh, should be avoided, we must exercise great care. Now, we have a lot of people coming here under special programs to work in our industries. And those folks need the, the opportunity to be treated well when they are going through customs here in our country. Ms. King, what is your position regarding intervention in countries that are violating the human rights of their own citizens? Being that I'm a libertarian, we do not believe in interfering in foreign countries, regardless of, of what's going on. A lot of things that we've seen happening in Kosovo and, and places in the Middle East are things that ha have been going on for thousands of years. My stance is that we need to just leave well enough alone and let them sort out their differences. We have enough things going on here in the U.S., human rights issues, that I think that we need to deal with. Congressman Wu, with our domestic priorities that we have, should the United States be active in providing foreign aid? If so, under what circumstances and what requirements would you attach to such aid? Yes, we should be engaged in the world. We should be providing both aid and, uh, in response to the prior answer, I think it is appropriate for the United States to be engaged in areas where we can stop genocide, where we can stop ethnic cleansing. When genocide is going on in Europe's backyard, such as in the Balkans, and we demonstrated an effective intervention there, I think it's incumbent upon us 
to take our responsibilities as part of the world community. The same is true of foreign aid. We have a very, very small portion of the federal budget allocated to foreign aid, and most of that money comes back to the United States in the form of purchases uh, by foreign countries uh, from the United States. We should assess whether they, the, the aid recipients are, uh, are allies, whether they are abiding by agreements, whether they are abiding, uh, respecting human rights in their own countries. Those are important considerations. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Mr. Starr, what criteria would you use in determining whether the United States military should intervene in regional crises? I believe that our, our military is primarily for the protection and for our national defense. I believe that our military should be used to support our friends and those who are our allies in the world, and that we should be very careful about inserting ourselves in what is family feuds. Now, we have seen our military uh, attached with the United Nations and even seen some of our soldiers prosecuted for refusal to wear the United Nations uniform. I personally don't believe that is right and I would not support forcing our soldiers to wear the UN, UN uniform. I believe that we need a strong defense and we're not adequately providing that today in support of our military. Ms. King, what issues must be considered in deepening the Columbia River Channel inland to Portland? Well, I think there's a lot of things that need to be considered. I know that we have a gentleman who lives up in Astoria by the name of Peter Hutala, who has been quite an activist in this area. And I've been in contact with him because I don't have the, the environmental background to really know all the issues that are at hand. I know environmentally we need to assess what could impact our fish, the people down river, and we need to look and see if there's a balance between the economic impact that it's going to make. I personally am against the river deepening project because I think environmentally the impact is not worth the economic impact, but I think before anybody would move on that, that they need to look at all aspects of the deepening. Congressman Wu, private business interests take exception with your stance on trade with China. How are you supporting first district business interests in Congress? Well, I believe that there are many businesses which exist today which are important to our future, and there are businesses that don't, haven't been created yet. We live in an environment of change, and education and research are keys to business success in the future. As they say in retail, it's location, location, location. And for high technology and the, and the business of the first congressional district, it is education, 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 and research. I have been fighting to reduce class size. I've been fighting to modernize our schools. I've been fighting to improve education through Pell Grants. And I've also been trying to solve current problems by working on an H-1B visa program that would allow high-tech workers into the country and in exchange the companies would help fund education for American citizens. These are all important steps and I do support channel deepening and increasing flights in the Portland airport uh, through uh, international flights and these are all important steps for uh, Thank you, Oregon Mr. businesses. Wu. Mr. Starr, you have stated there is a Clinton war Clinton-Gore war on the West, supported by Mr. Wu. Please explain what you mean and how the protection of the environment can be balanced with jobs. Under the Clinton-Gore forestry plan, we've seen the industry here devastated. Jobs have been lost, mills have been closed, insects and disease are ravaging our forests. We've lost more trees than we're able to grow because we're not managing for harvest and full use. I believe that in order to be environmentally friendly, we must grow trees for harvest. There's nothing more environmentally friendly than that. For nothing can replace the wood products that is less polluting or 
as little polluting as the wood products. I, I believe that we must continue to manage our forest for harvest and open those up for multiple use without abuse, and that is where I would go. We have time for one more round of questions from our panelists. Ms. King, how can timber harvests on federal lands be managed more efficiently to provide income to forest-dependent countries? I, oh, counties, because I was going to say, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Federal lands be managed to more efficiently provide income to forest-dependent counties. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think the first step is to privatize as much of the forest lands as possible because it's a known fact. You think about your own yards and any land that you own. Don't you take better care of your own property than somebody else who doesn't have a vested interest in that property? So I think that we need to look towards privatization and give people the opportunity to take care of their land as opposed to when the government's involved, they tend to not do what is right according to what's best interest for that property. Mr. Wu, should the United States strengthen or diminish its role in the United Nations? First, let me just touch on the last question. Um, I have worked very hard on a county payments bill on a bipartisan basis with Greg Walden and Darlene Hooley, and federal payments for timber harvest are coming to places like Columbia County and Washington County in a very effective way. With respect to the United Nations, I think that we need to strengthen our role in the United Nations, and I disagree with my opponent, Mr. Starr, uh, in, in not participating in UN peacekeeping missions. It is incumbent upon us as the sole uh, great power left in the world to at least cooperate with other nations and act with them in keeping the peace. It is in our vital national interest, it is in our vital economic interest, and it is a moral duty. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Mr. Starr, what role should the United States be playing in the World Trade Organization? As a major trading nation, as a leader in world commerce, we need to play a major role. We need to be involved in, in a way that makes opportunity for free and fair trade, to protect our own industry in, in establishing rules so that there's a level playing field. We do that by engaging and by being involved in, in establishing the rules. I believe it's important that we do so, that we be involved there, and that this opportunity for our business to engage in world <laughs> commerce on a level playing field is established uh, with U.S. leadership. Thank you, Mr. Starr. That concludes this portion of our program, and thank you very much to our two panelists. During the next portion of the program, each candidate will ask the same two questions of the other two candidates. Candidates will have one minute to respond, after which the questioner will have an optional 30-second rebuttal. We will begin with Ms. King. Mr. Wu will respond first, followed by Mr. Starr. When surveyed, 69% of Americans said they would prefer to opt out of Social Security and take the responsibility to invest for their own retirement. As a representative of the people, would you support giving the people what they want? I absolutely do support encouraging people to save privately and to build for their own retirement. Social Security, as currently uh, constructed, as historically constructed, is a pay-as-you-go system. So the current dollars coming in are going out to current recipients. Social Security is part of a secure retirement system. In contrast to my opponent, Mr. Starr, who voted to take Oregon out of the social, federal Social Security system, I believe in shoring up Social Security as a basic building block for retirement and then adding on top of that opportunities, tax-free opportunities for savings so that uh, pension, private pension plans, private savings, and Social Security can become three cornerstones for a secure retirement. Thank you, Mr. Wu. 
Social Security taxes have not been allocated in the Social Security Trust Fund, but have been for many years now used uh, in the general fund of the federal government. We've spent those monies. It's not a pay-as-you-go program. It is a program that's paid essentially out of the general fund since those funds are so used. I believe that with the impending uh, expected budget surplus that we must set aside Social Security as a trust for those retired members of our society and those who will soon retire. It must be fully protected, no reduction in benefits. At the same time, to do away with the intergenerational warfare that is imminent, we must make available to the working men and women in America the opportunity to invest a small portion of their income in suitable investment accounts that they control and own and can pass on to their heirs. Thank you, Mr. Starr. Mr. Wu, your first question of uh, your opponents. Mr. Starr, Mr. Wu. I'm sorry, rebuttal. optional rebuttal. Excuse me. Yes. Yeah, because I do have a rebuttal. Um, as a, if that's what the people want, absolutely, I would give them the opportunity to opt out. Chile, as a matter of fact, has had a program and still does have a program that is very similar to our Social Security that they actually started 10 years before we started ours. So, of course, they ran into problems prior to us running into our problems. In 1980, they gave citizens the opportunity to opt out. And I'm happy to say that today 90% of Chileans have opted out and they, not, they report that they look forward to a decent retirement, plus the account holders are free to pass their funds on to their family and children. Thank when you, Ms. King. And now, Mr. Wu, your first question of your opponents. Mr. Starr will answer first. Mr. Starr, I voted for a federal violence against women's act that would create an office in the Department of Justice to, to protect women from domestic violence. Inexplicably, you were one of only three Oregon legislators to vote against an Oregon law to protect Oregon women from stalkers. That statute, that bill passed and is now Oregon law. How can you explain your vote and what would you say to women who are now protected by that Oregon law about your vote against it? I certainly appreciate that women are protected by that law. And I have been a strong proponent and supporter of those community-based solutions that provide shelters for women, opportunities for them to be protected from violent mates. I think it's absolutely important that women have the ability to break away from those relationships that bringing harm and even death. I think that we must continue to support all efforts to protect our women, to value our women. 44 years of marriage, my wife and I, we work together. My parents just celebrated this year 68 years together. I value women. I support women. Ms. King. Excuse my ignorance, but I thought it was against law to be violent to anyone, men, women, or children. Is that your comment? That's it. <laughs> Mr. Wu, the rebuttal. Well, Mr. Starr, it's not really about you, and it's not about a commendably long marriage that you have had. It is about protecting Oregon women from stalkers from whom they did not have protection before. You are fond of saying that we should have local control and states' rights. However, when you had an opportunity to vote on this issue at the state level, you voted against it. And one should question whether what kind of support you would give it at the federal level. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Mr. Starr, your question of your opponents, Ms. King will respond first. David and Beth, under the Clinton-Gore forestry plan, the forest products industry has been devastated. Jobs have been lost and mills closed. Insect and disease have devastated our forest. Clinton-Gore has proposed additional millions of acres of roadless areas to be set aside which would prevent multiple use of the resource. 
What have you done and what will you do to make sure that the opportunity for men and women of Oregon, of our state, to enjoy and use this renewable resource now and in the future? Actually, I kind of already answered that previously when I talked about privatization of our forests. And unfortunately, my next question actually gets into what you were talking about. So I don't want to talk too much more on that issue. And you'll know why when I give my next question. Mr. Wu. Well, I have worked on two pieces of legislation which I believe strike the right balance between current harvest and what we must do for good stewardship into the future. The first was, a, was two attempts in the last two years to balance our needs for current harvest versus preserving our watersheds and enhancing our wildlife. I brought forth the Wu Hooley Amendment last year, and this year the Wu Udall Amendment, and it would have better balanced out the money that we were spending for forest harvest versus protecting watersheds and protecting wildlife, because all of that needs to be done for a balanced long-term harvest. This year, on a bipartisan basis with Greg Walden and others, we successfully protected the Steens Mountains, and we worked with the cattle ranchers, and they cooperated, and we finally passed federal legislation in the waning days of this Congress, and those mountains will be protected forever, and the cattlemen will have their livelihoods protected thank, also. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Mr. Starr? Yes, you did vote and, and made the motion to move $14.7 million from the forestry management budget to wildlife management. At a time when our forests are dying from insects, no salvage logging allowed. Our Douglas spur invaded by needle cast disease and dying by the thousands. We need salvage logging, we need management for harvest, and you voted against that. Ms. King, your second question of your opponents, Mr. Wu will respond first. Most Americans are concerned about the environment. Here in Oregon, we're concerned about our trees. Although you will hear that trees are a renewable resource, it takes so long for a tree to grow. What would you or would you not be open to exploring, sorry, would you or would you not be open to exploring alternatives such as hemp? Why or why not? Well, uh, quite frankly, I don't see the connection between hemp and forestry. Uh, but let me uh, try to answer the forestry question and say that, you know, I think that it is a very sound use, a one of the multiple uses of our federal forest lands uh, to both harvest timber and use it for recreational and conservation purposes. That is why I have consistently supported multiple use, including forestry, and I believe in a balance between conservation, recreation, forestry, and, and, and other uses. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Mr. Starr? Well, of course, hemp would, could be used for paper. But is, there is no way that hemp use as a paper product would be able to produce as much per acre as we can from growing trees. We would have to take thousands, hundreds of thousands of acres out of, out of uh, agricultural production or out of forestry in order to produce the same amount of pulp for paper. I think it's a bad idea. I think the growing trees for, for wood and pulp is uh, environmentally friendly. If you want to lower CO2 in our atmosphere, you do that by planting a tree. That, that works. They love it. They grow faster. I think that that is a solution that we must look to. Ms. King, your rebuttal? And actually, the, the point of the question, and obviously I wasn't clear, wasn't so much the tree issue as looking at alternate for, forms of, like, to use for paper and things like that. And the Declaration of Independence is one document that was actually written on hemp, and Columbus's sails were made of hemp. Hemp has over 25,000 different uses, and it is, grows in months rather than years. And so that's why I was just asking if people would be open to looking at alternatives. Mr. Wu, your second question of your opponents, Mr. Starr will answer first. Mr. Starr, I believe in keeping our commitment to prior generations and shoring up Social Security and Medicare first and using our budget surplus to do that. 
in the Oregon legislature, it was inexplicable to me how you voted in favor of taking Oregon out of the federal Social Security system. Can you please explain that vote to the voters of Oregon, and especially our senior citizens? And Ms. King, would you also take Oregon out of the federal Social Security system? Thank you, Mr. Wu. We must protect our obligation to our senior citizens, and that is one thing that I have promised I will support first, and that out of the federal uh, budget surplus. I believe that it is important that we keep our commitments. To get out of the Social Security system would be an advantage to any citizen who's working and is diligent about uh, providing for his family and saving for his future and providing for his grandchildren. And I know that within this country we have communities that have opted out of Social Security and they're doing a better job providing retirement for themselves and their children. I believe it's consistent that we look at ways that we help the working men and women of today and that we continue to make good on our pledge to those of our seniors, elder citizens, with Social Security. Ms. King. In answer to taking Oregon out of Social Security, I would open it up to anybody who wanted to opt out of Social Security and not make it just a state matter. As far as taking the budget surplus to shore, shore up Social Security, just the fact that we're having to shore up Social Security should kind of be a little bit of an eye-opening experience. But I also have uh, statistics from a study that was done over the last 50 years, and any time there's a budget surplus, 74 cents of every dollar has been actually spent on new spending. It hasn't gone to help out debt reduction. Only 21 cents goes to debt reduction and 5 cents for tax reduction. So I would be a little skeptical whether we should take a surplus because all it looks like to me is they tend to just do more spending. Mr. Wu, your 30-second rebuttal. Well, Mr. Starr voted to take Oregon out of the Social Security system and now says he supports Oregon seniors and keeping Social Security solvent. Mr. Starr voted against protecting Oregon women from stalkers, and now he says he is in favor of protecting women and families. And I've got only one thing to say. Be careful of election year conversions. I have made commitments to the voters of Oregon, commitments that I have kept at great political cost. Thank you, Mr. Wu. That's time. Mr. Starr, your second question of your opponents. Ms. King will respond first. David, at our last debate, you explained your vote against fair and free trade with China was based on your concerns for human rights in the region. Taking you at your word, could you explain to our district, and in particular the working men and women at Intel, how, in spite of all the human rights violations in sub-Saharan Africa, I have a report from Amnesty International that says they're the most violent region in the world as far as human rights are concerned. How could you vote for this? Okay, excuse me, Mr. Starr. Ms. King is to respond first. Ms. King, would you uh, okay, uh, well, um... answer that question, please? <laughs> First of all, I, I would have been open to trade with China because I think free enterprise is the way to help human r relations, human rights. And so I believe that we, as a country, should enter into trade with anybody. We see what trade embargoes do. Look what happened in Cuba. The goal of that trade embargo was to get Fidel out. And uh, I think he's still there last time I heard. So I wasn't against trade with China. Mr. Wu? There's a very simple answer to why I voted for the Africa Trade Bill. It was because there were human rights protections written into that bill. And if there had been human rights protections written into our legislation with respect to China, I could have considered supporting it if they were sufficiently enforceable. These are two different pieces of legislation, and one, the Sub-Saharan Africa Trade Bill, had human rights protection written into it. Our agreement with China ignored human rights completely. And let me go on to make a further point. I am completely for engagement, but engagement does not mean engagement just through the cash register. As a great power, 
we need to engage across a spectrum of issues ranging from national security to rule of law to human rights. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Mr. Starr, your rebuttal. Free enterprise opens countries to the, the possibility, even the probability, of democracy. I believe that engagement in free trade, fair and free trade, is important to our nation, to our citizens, to our working men and women, that it is important not only to us, but to those countries that need to trade with us. We open up those opportunities. We improve conditions in the world. We improve human rights, religious freedom. And by doing so, we improve the whole world. Thank you, Mr. Starr. We now move to the final portion of our debate program, three-minute closing statements from each of our candidates. The order for closing statements was determined by a separate drawing of numbers held last week. We will begin with David Wu, followed by Beth King, and conclude with Charles Starr. Mr. Wu. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today, but because Congress is still in session, I had to be with you all by telephone. As you've seen, we've discussed many important issues, and there are dramatic differences between my opponents and me. I believe very strongly in supporting public education. I fought for class size reduction and school construction and modernization. In contrast, Mr. Starr was one of only six members of the Oregon House to vote against basic education support for Oregon public schools. I fought to keep Social Security and Medicare secure. In contrast, Mr. Starr voted to take Oregon out of the national Social Security system. This is unbelievable, but true. I do believe in a woman's right to choose. Mr. Starr does not. I voted to reauthorize the Violence Against Women Act. In contrast, Mr. Starr was one of just three legislators to vote against the law that now protects Oregon women from stalkers. These are important differences. Public decisions have a profound effect on people's lives. I know this from the public decision that allowed my family to be reunited in America, to the many public decisions that permitted generations of Americans to get a good public education and achieve all of their opportunities in life. That's why in Congress, I have fought and I'm fighting today to improve public education by reducing class size and modernizing facilities. That's why in Congress, I have fought and I'm fighting today to preserve Social Security for this generation and for future generations. That's why in Congress, I supported a guaranteed prescription drug benefit through Medicare to all seniors who choose it. This election is about important issues. I'm proud to have been your advocate in Congress for the past two years. I ask for your support. I ask for your vote. Thank you, Mr. Wu. Ms. King, your closing statement. I would imagine most of you in this room have never run for U.S. Congress, so I wanted to close by giving you a little bit of insight on what it's been like. First of all, I have been very appreciative of events like this and candidate forums that have allowed all the candidates to have an opportunity to speak on the issue so you hear from everyone. Most of the cable access stations were available to the candidates so that you could be better informed on the issues. KATU Channel 2 even gave a free two-minute spot so that the candidates could come on during their 5 o'clock news and you could hear directly from them. The people in the first district that I've met as I've been campaigning have just been fantastic. They've given me a lot of encouragement and they were very excited about the fact that I stood up and decided to do something like this considering I don't really have a political background. Then there's the newspapers. The Oregonian, and I have Dave Hogan to thank, I see he's over here so I can do it publicly. The Oregonian actually included me in some of the stories on the first district. It was only like one line, but I, I was still there, so I, I have Dave to thank for that. And they also provided a voter questionnaire that gave you an opportunity to see how we feel on the different issues. Heaven forbid, though, if the media does not like you. What I found particularly disturbing, though, was that a lot of the newspapers feel that it's their duty to actually give you their opinion as to how you should vote. And I don't know about you, but my brain is still functioning, and I would prefer to make that decision on my own. So what have I learned? 
Well, I've learned that being a representative in Congress doesn't necessarily mean you will be representing the people of the district. It seems the politicians are fueled by the desires of special interest groups than they are by individuals. I've also learned that people are getting really disgusted with our current two-party system and that they're really ready for a change. I've learned that politicians are willing to spend huge sums of money to get elected, but I haven't figured out yet whether it's for the control or the power. And the final thing I've learned is I'm not a politician. And I'm glad about that. Would I make a good representative in Congress for the first district? Absolutely. Anybody who knows me would tell you that I would be. In fact, I've been getting calls and emails from Democrats and Republicans telling me that they have voted for me, and many people who I don't even know who have been calling me and emailing to say, I'm voting for you just because they liked how I took a stand on some real issues in my voter statement. When I think about how big our government has gotten over the years and how much of a tax burden we now have, a quote comes to mind, and I'm going to close with this. There is no worse tyranny than to force a man to pay for what he does not want merely because you think it's good for him. I've enjoyed myself today. I thank you for your attention and your support, and have a great day. Mr. Starr, your closing statement. A vote for Charles Starr is a vote for responsible government. Good government, not more government. A government that meets the needs of its senior citizens and the most vulnerable physically or mentally challenged, regardless of age. To our greatest generation, our seniors, I want to be clear, we will save Social Security first. I'll continue to work for an education system that delivers on the promise of a world-class education for all, a system with high expectations and with measured results, a Head Start program that teaches children the sound of the letters so they can build words so they are reading by the end of the first grade. An education system that leaves no tra child trapped in failed schools. I'll fight for our national sovereignty and a government that serves the people, not taking our liberty in exchange for some perceived benefit. I'll work to, to strengthen our armed forces and provide for sure defense of our country and make military pay and benefits a priority. We will remain a world leader through strength, never a bully, and never the world's policeman. I'll fight to lower your tax burden so you will enjoy the fruits of your labor. A tax system is less intrusive and more simple to file and administer. This will help produce the benefits of a vibrant economy and better paying jobs. I'll work to reduce the unnecessary regulation while encouraging environmental stewardship. Our forest must be managed for multiple use without abuse. Our waters must be cleaned up and the air must be cleaned up. This includes raw sewage. I'll listen to you, seek sound advice, and make wise decisions based on the facts, sound science. I'll work for you and make you proud. Vote Charles Starr, put my life experience to work for you in Washington. I invite everyone to visit our campaign online at starforcongress.org. If you want common sense Oregon values in Congress, then this is your campaign, and I am your candidate. I ask for your support, and I ask for your vote, and I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Starr. I would like to thank our candidates, both present and in absentia as well as the League of Women Voters for co-sponsoring this series of debates. I was also delinquent earlier in the program and did not introduce another new City Club member who's here with us today, Jeff Friedlove, who's with the Morning in America group. Welcome, Jeff, and we are adjourned. <laughs>